to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. Joining me tonight is my pal Frank Santorowski as we dive into another lost track. This one, not necessarily of the IndyCar variety, but a pretty cool old racetrack in Long Island, New York, known as Bridgehampton Race Circuit. So, Frank, again, thanks for joining and helping me out. How are you doing tonight? Oh, good, man. Thanks for having me. I always appreciate it. I always have fun with these. I'm sad this is our last one. Well, we'll uh, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun to, to keep busy over the off season, and I'm sure next off season we'll have plenty more of these to do, and we'll figure out something to do during the year too. Oh, well, certainly, yeah. We'll so. figure something out to to keep the fans and all of their old school history buffs uh, happy throughout the year. Absolutely. With that being said, Bridgehampton Raceway, for those who are curious, was in uh, Sag Harbor, New York, which is Long Island, the very east coast of New York. Uh, The Hamptons are somewhat nearby. So with that being said, where did it start? I know it's it's, it's got a a really cool history, and uh, so we'll start there. So now you got to go all the way back to like um, the when we had the big – influx of immigration and the the port of immigration was uh you know, ellis island which is the new york area and uh, through the you know the late 1800s and the early 1900s there are a lot of europeans came through that port and settled in you know new york new jersey connecticut and you know there were it, it took them a while to to, to kind of get farther south and whatnot but the, a lot of europeans settled in that area now europeans love racing through the streets you know so whereas you know the the oval oval track racing that was beginning to pop up in other parts of the country on you know a kind of uh horses that were originally purposed or horse tracks that were repurposed for race cars the racing through city streets really took took hold in in, in the north and it was very popular and you know, even when you talk about uh, things like the old Vanderbilt Cup races that started back in I believe 1904 uh, they were they were up there in that New York area this was a very very popular form of racing a lot of folks would watch it and and it was it was it was dynamite it was fun to watch it was very european because it's the same thing that they the early grand prix were all run through villages and city streets you know with very little barriers or anything to to, to kind of keep the racing safe but as it as time wore on there was a pushback in the the early 1950s and in the fact there was a a pretty horrible crash at one of these new york races where driver and three spectators were killed and then the state of new york they they put a ban on racing through the streets. So Bridgehampton was built for the very same reason that Watkins Glen was built. Watkins, Watkins Glen initial racing was through the village. So they they come up with the idea. So well, we'll just, we'll just go ahead and build a, a permanent road, you know, closed course. And um, you know these these guys, a couple guys that were involved with the SCCA, um, they put together and they called it the uh, Bridgehampton Road Race Corporation, and they said about building the track you know the first thing they had to do was find a plot of land and they they found a, a big plot of undeveloped land on the hillside that was just it was all trees and it was all rocks the upside to that is the real estate was rather inexpensive and then pretty much what these guys ended up doing to uh, make this happen they started selling shares and they would literally set up in front of a garage or set up in front of a, a drugstore in town and uh, sell these shares for five bucks a piece uh, to just kind of kind of anybody that would that, that would want to be a part of it, and they they actually able to finance and build the track. So now the track itself, I don't know if you've got the layout in front of you, but it's, I, do, um, I do, yeah, yeah. So it's a very, it's a really interesting looking course. There, it is just a little under three miles, I believe it. It it's two point eight six miles. There's twelve turns and a hundred and thirty feet of elevation. And it's, it's got a combination of swooping straightaways, straight straightaways, and very tight turns. Uh, matter of fact, uh, a guy that we may have heard of, Sterling Moss, said it was the most challenging race course in the United States. 
And that was kind of the goal of the Bridgehampton Road Race Corporation. They wanted to build a track that was second to none. And that was their, their motto. We're going to build a track that's second to none. And, and they achieved that. But if you look at the early track, compared to what you might see on a road course today, uh, you know, there was no armco barriers. Uh, you know, there, there were steep drop-offs, you know, to kind of keep uh, – uh, some cars on the track or keep them from going too far off the track. They had rocks, you know, which uh, when, when you think about it in today's terminology, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just put a bunch of rocks here so the car doesn't go, go down the cliff. So it was, it was interesting. It was challenging. Uh, the first event they ran there was a uh, Harley Davidson club came out there, kind of christened the track, you know, had some motorcycle racing and whatnot, nothing sanctioned, but uh, like a club event. Um, their first big sanctioned race, they had the SCCA come in there, and that was in September of 1957. So that was the real, the, the true opening of the track. We call the motorcycle event that was soft open, but uh, they had the SCCA in there, and they ran several different classes. I, I want to say it was like 17 races, in, or, or five different races, 17 classes. You know, as the SCCA always runs, so they they pretty much have the nationals there. So it was uh, very successful to the point that they had a lot of folks there. Now the problem with all the folks they had there was that uh, they really hadn't kind of thought everything through to make sure that everyone paid the price of admission. You know, they didn't have a lot of security in place, so they a lot of people b- bypassed the main gate wandered through the woods until they found a place to watch the race and just watch for free. So, you know, by the end of their first season of racing, they had tremendous crowds, but no, uh, <laughs> very little income. <laughs> Nobody was paying. Nobody was paying, but everybody was watching. Right. And then the racing was good too. So, so they, you know, after that, they, they kind of really got in trouble with the finances. They, they, they hired a group of people. Okay. And these were astute lawyers, promoters, businessmen, security people. They they all they all joined the board pro bono because they believed in the track. That they believed that this was a great business interest. It just wasn't being run exactly properly. So you had, you know, and and just to back this up, this it's a very affluent area, the uh, you know Long Island area, you know near the Hampton. So so you have some pretty astute, smart businessmen living in there that believed in this. So, so they came in and they, they kind of fixed things up, shorted up a little bit. So, and, and then, then from there, they were able to kind of get over the hurdle of the, the, the first year problem. Yeah. The, uh, the, the track itself. Now I'm just looking at a black and white map. The, the front straight was almost three quarters of a mile long. So it was a really cool setup. You can see how the crazy speeds they carried would be pretty dangerous, especially when there's, oh, I don't know, just some boulders to keep you from going off into uh, too far into the, into the woods there. So really cool setup. I don't know exactly where this is in Long Island. I, I don't really like driving up there because it takes forever from the Philadelphia area, but I think I'm going to have to drive up there at some point. I'll just run through some names here before I turn it back over to you in the Trans Am series. Indy cars, Mark Donahoe won twice, 1968, 1970, one year for a Roger Penske entry in a Camaro Z28, and the other for a Penske racing in an AMC Javelin. I don't even know what kind of car that is, but it was in 1970, so I have a little bit of an excuse there. Yeah, AMC Javelin was, you know, a very popular Trans Am type car. I mean, you'll see a lot of images of Sweet Savage in this AMC Javelin. Uh, but yeah, they... they you know, this this was again an era where a lot of guys there was a lot of crossover. You know, you, you didn't stick to stock cars or sports cars or Indy cars. You raced where you could race. So you, you had guys like uh, the Formula One guys, Phil Hill, Dan Gurney, Bruce McLaren, uh, racing there. Mario's racer, Sam Posey, Chris a- Amon, Denny Holm. You know, like you said, Mark Mark Donahue. Uh, a lot of these guys would would do those sports car races. You know, guys like Jackie Eakes. You'd find out there, Bridgehampton, all wanted to tackle this circuit that they found to be a very, very challenging circuit. As a matter of fact, they the, the the one turn there coming down the hill, which I, I can't think of the turn number right at the second, was described as perhaps the most difficult turn in all of racing. Sam Posey had, had made a comment that it was like uh, being in a fighter jet. Uh, it was 
it was it was a pretty neat road course again you know very dangerous i don't think there were a ton of fatalities there but uh certainly there were a lot of guys that they got in some trouble there you know and, and again like you said if you watch and there's a lot of old rich hampton videos on youtube yeah i i, I it's tough to tell based on this black and white map what what corner he's talking about but there are some kind of swooping corners that you could see possibly being downhill and then right into a a sharp corner or you know carrying a lot of uh g-forces into the into the next corner so i can see some spots on here being pretty tough and i'll share this map that i have found i know it's it's not particularly detailed but for everybody out there listening so they can take a look at the track yeah another thing they did when they brought this uh, group of, of consultants in for lack of a better word was they they tried to make a like a vip section right so uh, interestingly enough they were tearing down the polo grounds which, that used to be the home of the new york giants before the giants moved to playing in yankee stadium for a while before they built giant stadium so they they took these cushy armchair seats out of the polo grounds and and line them up on the front straightaway to make like a VIP section. You know, there's kind of the precursor to the suites you'd see today. So, um, you know, that was pretty neat. And it honestly attracted a lot of the racing attracted a lot of uh, a local celebrities and businessmen. Again, like I said, this is a fairly affluent area, um, area. And in 1965, they reintroduced the Vanderbilt Cup. And they, they held the Vanderbilt Cup there at Bridge Hampton for a while. And, and again, that's a Long Island-based trophy that is still kind of used today. <laughs> but, yeah, but they reintroduced the Vanderbilt Cup as that prestigious uh, thing there for, for the sports car race. So it was, uh, uh, you know, bringing back in and then leaning on the, the heritage of Long Island race. Yeah, it's a very interesting area. You have Watkins Glen that's not too far away from there. Lime Rock up in Connecticut, which I don't think is too far from Long Island. Not a hundred percent certain there, and then. Oh, a matter matter of fact, Bridgehampton lies right on the water there, and you can see the coast of Connecticut from the track, or from where the track once was. Even it, better. It, right there, yeah, yeah. And Lime Rock is another track that kind of propped up due to the, you know, ban on street racing that was becoming more and more prevalent in the Northeast. I mean, Lime Rock's another great track um, up in that area. Yeah, and uh, another smaller track that. I think is still in existence. I think I've driven by it a couple of times near the Long Island, Connecticut areas, Thompson Speedway, which is a five eighths of a mile oval. I'm pretty sure they do some sort of sprint car races there still. Uh, don't don't quote me to that one, but we'll uh, we'll look into it. It's known as Indianapolis of the East, and it popped up in my Bridgehampton research, so figured I would mention that. So Indianapolis of the East, it's a five eighths oval. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I you but know, but again, you know, but again, like 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 I said earlier, the the road racing was much more popular in the Northeast, and and ovals kind of kind of really caught the attention of the folks down south and and in the Midwest. And no offense to my Connecticut listeners, if we have any outside of the people in my family, but there's there's not a lot going on there, so they have to get creative with their with the names of of tracks and things to do there. So again, now we're at the point in the episode where. Things started to go south for Bridgehampton. I'm pretty sure we can guess where this is going, but I will let you explain it. Well, the first thing, the first nail in the coffin was the a lot of the a lot of the land around the track was not zoned, and they they went ahead and, and I want to say it was in 1960, late late 67, 68. They rezoned all that stuff residential. Okay, and then again, that being prime real estate, uh, especially for some wealthy folks, uh, they began developing housing developments immediately. And then, of course, as soon as the housing developments cropped up, so did the noise complaints. I mean, you know, you, you always want to say, well, you know, if you didn't, you know, why do you live next to a racetrack or, or build next to an airport if you don't like the noise? Uh, so they said, well, our houses are here now. So uh, they the the city of Bridgehampton sided with the 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 new homeowners homeowner associations and they put in some noise restriction laws that really put an end to professional racing there so there was no more you know top tier uh, racing there and again in the past they had they had hosted Can Am they had hosted a NASCAR um, they they had hosted um, a lot of SCK races so it, they pretty much just kind of switched to club racing which was all they could do club racing with guys with uh, 
you know, big mufflers on your cars and, uh, you know, and just be, be quiet about it. So eventually the track was sold to a guy named Robert Rubin. He bought, he bought up all the shares and he tried to get a, a lift on the noise restrictions, even like a temporary one. And I mean, to put this all into contrast or to put this in context, this is what, this is happening at Lime Rock right now. Where they're they're having battles with the, the noise restrictions, so he was trying to get temporary at least to say this week, this one weekend, I want to hold a vintage event with uh, real race cars that are allowed, and can I do this once a year? And pretty much, uh, he tried, 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 and they did no, you know, they just weren't having it at all. So uh, he uh, ended up saying, well, maybe I put a golf course here, that'll be nice and quiet, and he did. So the, uh, the the Bridge Hampton Golf Course, known as the Bridge, now sits where the track used to be. The lovely thing about it, though, is you know a lot of times when we get to this part of the episode, we say, "Is there anything you can still see of the track?" Right? And it's always, yeah. like, "Oh no, there's a Walmart there, there's a housing now." Actually, there you can see quite a bit of the track of Bridge Hampton because they preserved the uh, bridge. Uh, that the cars would go under the Dunlop Bridge, and they preserved the front straightaway, the starter stand, and the start finish line, and that's all right on the golf course. And then the other really neat thing there, the clubhouse at the golf course is just packed full of racing memorabilia on the walls, hanging from the ceilings. Um, the unfortunate thing about that is it's kind of tough to see. It's a very exclusive golf club, uh, an annual membership. Is right around a hundred thousand dollars if you'd like to Holy golf. Hell. Yeah, if you like to golf at the bridge, so guys like you and I can't always <laughs> go out there and, and and play nine holes. Uh, but but all that all that history has been preserved, and they it's just neat that they kept that, and they still you know, and then they call the the golf course the bridge. So in homage to that, where where some spectacular racing was held from the late fifties. Uh, all the way up to, I believe it was 1998 when they they finally raised the track entirely and built the golf course. So, uh, you know, sad that it's gone, but but great that the, the history is preserved. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I read when you sent me the link to the website, there will be a, a bigger museum being built for the history of the racetrack era there. But I can't get the website to load right now, so that one... We'll have to wait to be confirmed until I can get it to load. But Frank, thanks very much for, for joining me on another one of these. This one was really cool to research. I, I had a lot of fun. Everybody listening, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back with these again plenty in the future. And Frank, thanks very much. I, I hope you have a good rest of your evening. Oh, you too, man. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you folks that tune in and listen to us too. Yeah, thank you everybody for listening. And we'll be back again. 